Good morning. My name is Kurt, one of the pastors at You Flourish Church, and we are excited that you're here to join us for this broadcast. Uh, this week, I was just thinking back uh, to high school. I remember ninth grade, uh, we, we were required to take the competency test. Uh, and if you didn't pass the competency test, uh, you did not graduate from high school. So I remember uh, taking a competency test, and uh, my friend and I were sitting uh, next to each other. And as um, take, taking the test, I noticed that my friend, and um, most of his answers are wrong. Um, so I do what a good friend would do, and I kind of push my paper over so he could start copying the answers uh, off my paper. And uh, his response to me just blew me away. He's like, man, I'm not copying off of you. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, he wants to be honest. <laughs> but what he said next blew me away. He's like, you're not smart. <laughs> Why would I copy off of you? I'm copying off of Ronald Jones. And he turned around to his left because Ronald Jones was sitting to his left. And uh, and so he copied the answers from, from Ronald Jones. And I could not have been uh, more more upset because uh, I'm thinking of nerves with this guy. You mean to tell me you're not going to copy off my paper? Uh, long story short, uh, when the results of the competency test uh, comes back, uh, I pass, and uh, my friend and Ronald Jones both fail a competency test. Uh, sadly, uh, my friend, he, he never graduated high school because he rejected uh, the very thing that could have saved him. In similar fashion, but much more serious, we, we come across a passage where Israel rejected the very thing that was meant to save them. And the three points that I'm going to make this morning is, is Stephen, he responds by declaring their fathers rejected Moses. Uh, Stephen responds by declaring their fathers rejected God. And, and Stephen responds by declaring uh, their fathers rejected Jesus. I will begin by unpacking our first point. If your Bibles are open, uh, let's turn to Acts uh, 7, beginning in the 30th verse. Uh, and, but before we go there, maybe we go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, God, you are good. We love you and we thank you for your mercy, for your grace, your love and your kindness. God, there's none like you. We pray above all that you would speak. And God, we pray that you will anoint our ears to hear. And God, we pray that you will anoint our hearts to apply all that you speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, uh, picking up in the 30th verse, and it reads, Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for forty years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. Uh, if you are following along, I want you to highlight in verse 35, this Moses whom they rejected. So here we, we pick uh, back up as Stephen, he continues to emphasize that God had never been confined to a temple. Uh, he, he's continuing this, and this is evidence in, in, in how God appeared to Moses in the wilderness. In fact, uh, God told Moses where he was standing uh, was holy ground, which also shows that, that God's presence cannot be confined to a building. And here's the thing that I, I think that we're learning right now that like, man, God's presence can, you, you know, we can put so much emphasis on the building and we've been placed in a, in a place 
uh, during this COVID season where for a period of time, many of our church buildings were, were shut down. And so, but, but Stephen, he's making this point to this council, to this, to, to, to this temple loving people because they really began to worship the temple at this time. And he's continuing to emphasize the fact that, that God presence was never confined to things that were made by man's hand. And, and, and Stephen, he, he emphasizes, the next thing that he does is he emphasizes Israel's rejection of Moses, even though God sent and appointed him ruler and redeemer of the Israelites. And, and here they are rejecting the very thing that was meant to, to, to save them. And so, so the takeaway uh, here is that, that one could be rejected by God, I mean, rejected by man, uh, yet appointed by God. And, and, and here's uh, the, the beauty behind that, because in, in other words, you know, how, how people perceive you has no bearing on who God says that you are. And I, and I mean, I, I could only imagine, you know, the, the dejection that Moses may have felt in leading a people who consistently rejected him. And there'll be times in our lives, again, this, this is why there's, there's a major takeaway, because oftentimes we allow people to <laughs> determine our worth. And, and, and I, I think this is a really important thing that, and a really important concept that we begin to, to, to get because, you know, people can't define your worth. God defines your worth. And so here's Moses uh, who's born beautiful in God's eyesight, who's, who God has chosen to lead, uh, you know, a, a huge remnant of people, and yet people reject him. And so I, I think there's a learning experience for all of us here because, again, no matter what people say you are, there'll be people in your lives who, who don't respect you. There'll be people in your lives who don't like you. There'll be people in your lives who don't love you. There'll be people in your lives that mistreat you. All of those things, but it has no bearing on who God says you are. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, your boss may not like you, but it has no bearing on who God says you are. And so here's a situation where, again, uh, he's Moses, he's rejected by man, but yet appointed by God. And when you become a child of God and you're walking and you're calling, just understand that, man, it's I, I am who God says that I am. And so so Moses, he, he continues to lead a stiff-necked people, rejecting his leadership at every turn. <laughs> I mean, at every turn, they're, they're, they're rejecting his leadership. And, and, and the enemy says, <laughs> you are rejected. But the Father says, you are the redeemer of those rejecting you. Now, here's the thing that really makes it tough. And this is why Jesus says, you know, to love your enemies. <laughs> uh, because I'm, we're, we're talking about a very difficult concept. I mean, the very people who are hating on you, the very people who don't like you and, and, and causing trouble and drama in your life, and the very people who may be rejecting you, what would it look like? What would it look like if you were their redeemer? And, and, and I'm not saying that you are or you're not, but I, I'm saying that as, as Christians, as followers, as imitators of Christ, that we all have a responsibility to love those that reject us. We all have this responsibility, uh, you know, to help redeem all those that are lost. And so, and you know, I often say sometimes, I mean, if, if our blessing uh, came through the hands of our enemy, would we ever receive it? <laughs> because oftentimes many of us would just <laughs> rather not have anything to do with our enemy or not have anything to do with those that, uh, you know, re re reject us as, as the Israelites rejected uh, Moses. And, and so here, here's this thing. I mean, here's this beautiful picture of being the redeemer of those Will reject you, and this this is this is Moses' situation. And and would you be so in tune with your calling? Can you be so in tune with your calling that no matter uh, how bad <laughs> the people are <laughs> that you've been called to, is that you recognize that I've still been called to them? And, and and this is very similar to Jesus. I mean, the very people that he was called to, I mean, rejected him, and yet he did not abandon the call. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a lesson, and, and, and I'm resting here a little bit because I want you to get this, that, that you just may have been called to be redeemer of those who have rejected you. You just might be called to be redeemer 
of those who are hating on you. And will they be redeemed? <laughs> that's, 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 that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. And so, and let me just say that there's, there is this temptation of wanting man's acceptance. I mean, I, you, we want to be accepted by our peers. I mean, that's, that, that's human flesh. Um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a human desire, but I, but I, I really think, and I want you to understand, I, I really want you to, 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 to grasp this concept that my worth is defined by God. <laughs> my, 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 my acceptance is defined by God and not by man. And here's this thing. He brought them out of this, out of slavery, Moses, despite their rejection of him. And, and here's the thing, you know. His call was not shaped by people's perception. <laughs> and, and here's the thing, because we will allow people to, to, to begin to, <laughs> uh, we will let the, the perception of people begin to shape our call. And you got to understand how people feel about me and what people say and what people think. I remember there were some times like, oh, man, you know, I, I, I grew up in, a, you know, a different kind of church. <laughs> and the church that I grew up in, I mean, we were more traditional. And, and, and when I started making some decisions to, to become very untraditional, I mean, there were, there were some, some bite back. I remember I, I painted the church orange and from this ugly brown and burgundy color. And, you know, I, uh, I, I got some bite back for that. I remember when I stopped wearing suits and I started wearing jeans, I got some fight back for that. And, and again, it's understanding who God had called me to be. And I, and I found myself trying to appease people's perception and become something that, that the people wanted <laughs> and that, that the people approved of. But in fact, I think it's really important that we tap into who God has called us to. And so Moses, uh, he continued to operate in exactly who God called him to be. And he did not allow the people to shape, his, the people's perception to shape uh, his call. For Moses, it didn't matter how they treated him. What mattered was how he treated them. <laughs> Uh, let, let me say this again. For Moses, it really did not matter how the people treated him. What mattered was how he treated the people. And that was part of his call. And, 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 and this is one of the things I think that we can learn today. Like, I mean, it don't matter. People always say, well, you know, they did this and they did that and they were wrong and they might be wrong. Certainly, they may be wrong. They may have been completely out of pocket, but they're not a Christian. <laughs> and I hear Christians that, uh, are, that complain about non-Christians as though it's a surprise. <laughs> it's not a surprise. They're supposed to hate on you. <laughs> they're supposed to not like you. I mean, they hated Jesus. Like, I mean, here's the thing. And so to expect to ex expect people to be right by you and to say the right things by you and all those things. It don't matter how they treated you. Your job as an imitator of Christ is to show Christ in every situation, in every circumstance, every opportunity that I get. It is an opportunity for Christ to be shown in the midst of a circumstance that the flesh would give what we know that the flesh would give. People expect to receive what the flesh will give. What people don't expect is to receive Jesus in the midst of their hatefulness, to receive Jesus in the midst of their spitefulness, to receive Jesus in the midst of like all of the haterade that, they're, 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 that they may be spewing. And Moses, like I said, it didn't matter how they treated him because when you've been labeled a redeemer. And that, that's his call. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, now, now that salvation is coming to the earth, I want you to understand that, that we've all been labeled a redeemer because God has, has, has put us into the world to be the light of the world, to redeem those from darkness. So I want you to remember that, that every situation that you find yourself in, remember your call. That, that every believer walks as a redeemer, as the light of the world. And, and so, so, so Stephen, he connects the dots and he lets them know. He's like, well, how, you know, you, the, your fathers rejected Moses. And he's letting them know your sons, as the sons, are, are rejecting the one that 
Moses prophesied would come. You know, there, there's a connection here, and there's this historical problem of, of rejection that, that continues to, to take shape uh, with Israel. Subsequently, St Stephen, he uses the religious leader's love for everything Moses, and, and he turns it upside down. Because even though that their fathers rejected Moses, now the sons is in this place where, oh, they love, they love Moses. They're quoting Moses at every turn. Well, Moses commanded this, Moses commanded that. Man, your fathers rejected Moses. <laughs> everything that he says. And now here you are, you're rejecting who Moses prophesied that would come after him. He said that, that there would be a prophet that was raised up like me, that, who would come after me. And, and so here it is, Stephen, he, he's turning it upside down because he know now that the sons, they, you know, here they are, they, they love Moses. And, and, but, but how can you love Moses and reject the one Moses spoke of? He, he promised again that there would be another prophet to come and could... Uh, and he charged them to listen to everything that the prophet would have to say. And the takeaway here is, is that the, the, the religious leaders, they too easily disconnected themselves from their father's sin. And this is what, I, uh, 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 here's the thing, because I'm, I, I think that the, the, we as people of God can too easily disconnect ourselves from, from the sins of the people that we read in the Bible. <laughs> um, and, and, and Stephen, he does an amazing job of, of making all of these connections. Like, you don't get to disconnect yourself uh, from the sins of the past. Let me show you how you're connected to the sins of the past by your sins today. And, and it's very remnants of, of, of Jesus as he deals with the Pharisees and scribes who bring the woman uh, who was caught in the act of adultery. And they says, well, Moses says that we are to stone her to death. What do you say? And of course, we know the story. Jesus, he bends down and he says, well, you know, uh, <laughs> he without sin cast the first stone. And one by one, each one of those men disappeared. And, and, and so, so he, he, here's the thing. Let us not disconnect ourselves from the sins of, of the past. Let us not disconnect ourselves from the sins, again, that we, that we read uh, and, and the word, the word is a Bible. And so um, I'm sorry, the word is, it is a Bible, but the word is a mirror for us to, to look in and to, and to, and to see ourselves. And, and so in light of their father's sin, they never asked, how might I be rejecting what God has sent to deliver me? Now they knew historically that their fathers rejected the very man that was meant to deliver them. They never asked that question. And here was the, the one that Moses prophesied about, um, that the, the they seen that stared them right in the face and, and they crucified them. They, they killed them. But it's a valid question for each of us. We have to ask ourselves is how might I be rejecting what God has sent to deliver me? You know, it may not look like what you want it to look, it may not feel like what you want it to feel, but it might be the very thing that God has sent to deliver you. Like, and, and, I, and I just hear people all the time making decisions based off of their flesh. And I hear people say, well, I don't want this. No, I don't want this. And I don't, but, 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 but what does God want? <laughs> and I think that's the most important thing that we begin to really tap into. What does God want for my life? And how do I identify that? And how do I walk into that? Uh, and, and, and so our life speaks to our acceptance or rejection of God's purpose for our life and everything that we do. Uh, our, our life, it speaks it. Either we're accepting or we are rejecting God's purpose of our life. And, and uh, unfortunately, we find that the Pharisees in, in Luke 7 and 30 says, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves. And, and, and I'm afraid, I'm, I'm so, so afraid that the people of God, time and time again, somehow, someway find themselves rejecting the purpose of God on their lives. And they're wondering, like, why aren't things flowing? Why, aren't my, why, why is my life not flourishing in, in, in the things that I desire? And, 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 and you know, and I, and I just simply would have to say, I mean, until we find ourselves walking in the purpose that God has for our lives. I, I think it's very difficult to find success because I'm, you know, I'm, success is not based off of what I do. Success is based off of the fact that I'm walking 
and the purposes of God in my life. Like, because this is not my plan. This is this is God's purpose, whatever, whatever it is, because God's purpose will stand. And, and sadly, many reject the purpose of God for their lives because they're too busy fulfilling the purposes of their flesh. <laughs> let me just let me just say that, because I mean, it's uh, hey. We, you know, we, we're going to have this flesh until the day that we die. But, until, but I mean, we, we got to whip this flesh into shape. Um, and, and, you know, the, the flesh is always wrestling against the spirit. And, and the word tells us that the spirit wrestles against the flesh. And, but, but here's what, what Paul says about that in Romans 8 and 6. He says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. Hear that now. He said, but to set the mind on the flesh is death. But he says, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And he goes on to say in Romans 13 and 14, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. He said, don't even make any provision for the flesh because I'll, I'll, here's the thing, uh, you know, the, the flesh will begin to choke out the spirit that God has placed in us. And as long as we operate from within our flesh, and again, we're going to live in this flesh for the, for, to the end of our days, but we have to recognize that the spirit that's within us is, is what needs to be leading us. And so that I would no longer, and, and, and that I'm consciously and intentionally uh, looking to walk in the purposes that God has for my life. And so what that means is, you know, it may not be what I like. It may not be what I prefer. It may not be what appeals to me, but it's God's purpose on my life. And so I had to change my mindset. What appeals to me now is not what, what my flesh likes, but what appeals to me now is what God likes. <laughs> it, it has to be because I know that that what, that, that that is what brings uh, success and, 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 and the ability to flourish is God's purposes and, and not the purposes of my flesh. And so what we see is, is, is Stephen, he does an amazing job in articulating to the council uh, their rejection of Moses. And so what we see that Stephen, he responds by declaring that the fathers rejected Moses. Uh, he responds also for my next point is that the fathers rejected God. And uh, let's pick up in um, verse 39 and look at what it says in verse 39. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol, and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch, and the star of your god Rephan, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. If you're following along in uh, verse 39, I want you to highlight in their hearts, they turn to Egypt and in verse 40, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us in verse 41. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. Now here, uh, Stephen, he shifts uh, from uh, Israel's rejection of Moses to their rejection now of God. In, in fact, he's, he's painting the picture that they have this problematic history of rejecting God. Israel has this, this history now. I mean, and now they're starting to uh, continue a pattern of, of rejecting God uh, throughout uh, scripture and, and Stephen, he's, he's pointing this picture, but he's also connecting the dots for him. You know, you rejected Moses, you rejected the prophets, you rejected God. And, and verse 39, Stephen says, our fathers refused to obey God and threw him aside. And again, how easy is it for us to look at this passage of scripture and like, man, you know, what's the matter with them people? <laughs> like, how could they do God like that and not look at ourselves? And, and, and it goes on to say, it says, in their hearts, they turn back to what God had brought them out of. 
In fact, they asked for gods to be made who would lead them back into the bondage that, that God rescued them from. Now, how crazy is that? <laughs> how cra and, and, but again, before we begin to start pointing the pointing the finger at them, I, I want us, uh, you know, I think who said it, somebody said it, like every time that you point a finger, you got like three fingers pointed back at you. <laughs> um, and so, so here's, here, here's that thing. Uh, and, and so a takeaway here is, is what I would have to ask is, does my life speak legitimacy to God's lordship over my life? That's a question for each and every one of us. Does my life speak the legitimacy of the lordship, of God's lordship of my life? And, I, and certainly uh, when we look at the uh, Israel and Israel's rejection of God, uh, they did not allow God to be Lord. <laughs> he consistently ended up being their savior, but they would not allow him to be Lord. And for the Israelites, I mean, Simply, this was a historical no, because they continue, they continue not to allow their life to speak legitimacy uh, to God's lordship. And, 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 and for us, when the going uh, gets tough, um, you know, as what we've seen for the Israelites, when the going got tough, they no longer trusted God's lordship. In one moment, they... <laughs> you know, in a repentant place and a repentant heart. And, you know, they want to do right before the Lord. And then the next moment when the going gets tough, um, you know, we give up on, Lord. we give up on his Lordship. <laughs> we give up on his Lordship. And so when it was a time where there was, where there was no food and God rained manna from heaven and they ate and they ate, um, you know, uh, there was a time where there was no water and they moaned and they groaned and they complained. There was a time where they wanted to talk to God. And they moaned and they groaned and they complained. And it, it just consistently, every time a challenge came, you know, there was always this doubt of having God as my Lord. I mean, when, when he is my Lord, like uh, I, I yield myself over to him. I yield my ways over to him so he could lead me out. When life is challenging, how often do we desert God for our old man? And what we see is that the, the Israelites, as Stephen is pointing out, he's like, man, y'all y'all threw God aside. You disobeyed him and you threw him aside. The moment that, that Moses left, you guys took all your, your jewelry and took all your gold and you asked Aaron to make you a god. So here it is. You, you made this thing with your own hands. And this is the thing that you're going to worship. Like God created us. <laughs> like, I'm worshiping who's created us. I'm not going to worship things made by hand. So when we begin to start talking about things that's made by hand that, that we worship, certainly our context is much different than the Middle East. And so you think about the things in our country, in our context that have been made by hand <laughs> that we worship. Think about that for a moment. But the point is, uh, I, I, again, my life should be able to speak legitimacy to God's lordship. I mean, in every area of our life, in every circumstance, my life should tell others that, that God is the Lord of my life. And, and so I, I have to ask myself a question. Does my marriage reflect that God is my Lord? Can my wife say that my life reflects in our marriage that God is my Lord? Can my husband say that my life <laughs> reflects that God is my Lord in our marriage? Whatever that looks like. I mean, I, we, we have to begin to start asking ourselves the tough questions. And I'm not saying this to make anybody feel bad. I mean, I say conviction is a good thing. I, I, I tell people all the time, let's, let's embrace conviction because conviction is proof that the Holy Spirit lives in me. <laughs> uh, what I would be worried about is when there's no longer any conviction. And so the second thing I'm going to have to ask is like, man, does, does the handling of my finances reflect that God is Lord of my life? I, and, and, you know, he, he, here's the thing, I, I, you know, and I, I don't talk about money much and, and what that looks like for the church and any of that, but I, I know for Didi and I, like, I mean, when you look at our finances, we, I mean, over the last uh, 20 years or uh, more, actually, uh, I think since we've be, be, been believers, actually, is that 
uh, we make sure that that our finances reflect that God is Lord. And I just tap back into what Jesus uh, says when they ask him if he should pay taxes. He said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And so we are, I'm not going to say we are generous <laughs> because I don't think that we could be generous to God, but let me just say that he is our Lord of our finances. And if you look at our finances, a good portion of our finances goes to the work of God and it goes to our local church. And, and just so for, for, for us, I mean, he, he, he's first. We, 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 we are tithers. We believe in tithing. We believe that the first 10% of anything that we bring in belongs to the Lord. That's, I mean, we, we, we believe it. We don't give it to a uh, shelter. <laughs> we don't give it to a nonprofit. Uh, we give it to uh, a local church. Um, that's, that's our belief. And I think everybody has to have, um, you know, that conversation with themselves and everyone has to be comfortable with themselves. But um, in, in this moment, as we are discussing God's lordship, the question is, like, is, is God Lord in every area of my life? And so um, we can't just have him in, in, in one area, not the other, but he's Lord in, in every area of my life. And, and because of that, he takes care of us. And, and so the other, other thing I would have to ask is, does my life reflect God is Lord in how I handle conflict? Again, I, I, and I don't, do I want to challenge you? Absolutely. I think that's what the gospel does. If you're feeling uncomfortable, you should feel uncomfortable because the gospel makes you uncomfortable. And so often, I see believers in the way that they handle conflict. So often, I see believers, every time I turn on Facebook, I, I, I see so much hate and so much ugliness that's spewing out based off of my preferences in the political arena or my preferences in the, the, social, uh, the social issues. But very, very few times do I see the believers handling the conflict that's happening in our society that it helps me to see that God is Lord of their life. In many instances, what I see is that their political agenda is Lord of their life or <laughs> their, their social uh, preferences is the Lord of their life. And I, I think this is just an opportunity for us to really begin to start checking ourselves. Does, does my view on the divisive issues in our country reflect that God is Lord of my life? Certainly, we all have personal views. Everybody has an opinion. Uh, don't matter much, but everybody has one. But at the end of the day, am I reflecting the legitimacy of God's lordship? Or are we making idols out of our preferences? Are we making idols? And, and again, let's 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 take the, the scripture of what we see from the Israelites that we are so quick to judge on. Yes, they made something <laughs> that they worship and they threw God aside, but are we throwing God aside because we've made a God out of the issues? We've made a God out of, out of our political uh preferences, we've made a God out of all of these different things, but yet our life is to reflect Christ. Point is, is how we live our lives will either reflect God as our Lord or reject God as Lord of our lives. Let me just say, there's no in between. <laughs> we either reflect or reject God in all that we do, say, think, or believe. Just trust that. <laughs> we either reflect or reject God in all that we say, think, or or do. There's no way around it. There's no in between. Stephen, he makes the point that the Israelites, they reject God as they reflect the desires of their flesh. And unfortunately, this is, <laughs> again, we might want to point the finger, but as we point the finger, we got three pointing back at us. You know, they were so blinded by their flesh they made idol gods to lead them back into the bondage that God had saved them from. Think about that. The Israelites wanted to go back to what they knew. And let me just say this, because I think sometimes when we look at this, we're like, man, how could they want to go back? How could they want to go back? But here, here's the thing, because oftentimes we'll find ourselves going back to what we knew before Christ. 
And let me just say this because, like, man, before before Christ for me, like, man, I, I really enjoyed my life. Like, I enjoyed my sin. Sin was fun. <laughs> like, and anybody who... who who pretends that like man sin was like like it was it was a, such a, I had such a terrible time no I had a ball <laughs> I really had a ball out there and so when I say that uh, you know people find themselves going back to what God brought them out of like I may have had a ball in what I was doing but I, you know in some instances I was addicted to some some terrible things uh, some terrible way of life, a uh, terrible way of life that would not have brought me much production in my life. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I was excited that God brought me out of those things because in some instances it was, it was bondage. I mean, waking up every morning and smoking a blunt and, and smoking a blunt all throughout the day and then smoke a blunt before you go to bed. And <laughs> man, that's a terrible addiction. Like, <laughs> um, and it's bondage. I mean, it's bondage. And living a life where uh, people's perception is means so much to you and everything that I did was based off of people's perception and God bring me out of that life where people's perception no longer matter, that, 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 that's bondage. And as you begin to think about your former life, even though you enjoyed some of the things that you've done, it was bondage. But here's the Israelite saying, man... Make us a, a God to take us back into the bondage that God has delivered us from. They want to go back to what they knew because the relationship with God is required of us. Faith. <laughs> you know, sometimes we may not see our way out, but the fact that he is Lord of my life, he is my guide. <laughs> We've just got to be willing to trust him. In verse 41, Stephen, he again, he connects the dots to their history of worshiping handmade things. You know, they, they worship the calf and, and, and they worship the temple. And, and as he's speaking to the council right now, they love the temple. In fact, they are accusing Stephen, Stephen of blaspheming against the temple. Um, and again, we have to continue to ask ourselves, what does this look like in our context? What is it that uh, we are throwing God aside for? And we, we, we have to look at that. In verse 42, it says, but God turned away and he gave them over to what they desired to worship. And here, here's the danger. Like, um, I mean, God's not going to wrestle with you. <laughs> He's not going to take away your desires for, you know, wanting to worship an idol God or placing idols before him. He just simply turns you over to the things that you decide to worship. And, and you know that and, and, and I find that as a, as, as a dangerous place, I find it as a very dangerous place. And so while we have an opportunity to correct ourselves before we wreck ourselves, <laughs> uh, you know, here's that opportunity where we get the opportunity. I mean, here's the opportunity where we have the chance to consider uh, and pay some attention to where we are at, where we're where we are at in our lives, and and what are some of the things that we may need to do to better align ourselves with with who God is and what He is in our lives. And this is why I always say, man, it really requires us to lay our life down. Because there's just some things that we, we can't do. You know, we want to do right and we find ourselves, our flesh doing something different. And, and Paul, he spoke to this. Uh, but this is why it just simply requires us to lay our life down. It requires us not to care about the issues. <laughs> I, I mean, at, at the end of the day, and, and, I, and this may upset somebody, but like, man, I can care less who's in the White House. <laughs> like, Man, I'm just a visitor here. Like, I am going to the kingdom. I'm going to see the king. Like, <laughs> I, I am. And I'm, I mean, we could find ourselves so caught up into the issues in our society that we've made idols out of them. And, and, and it, it begins to consume us. And we think our life is going to be so bad if so-and-so gets in the office. Or, you know, no, your life is going to be the same. <laughs> Like, no matter who's been in office in my life, no president in the United States in the history of my life has impacted my life one iota. Not one politician has impacted my life one iota. And, you know, I used to get caught up into that until I just realized, you know, this is what divides us. This is, this is what makes God thrown aside. 
And when I seen the church doing it, that's where it really broke my heart the most because it's, it's mostly the church that's fussing and fighting over who's liberal and who's conservative. Like, man, can we just love Jesus? Can we throw the idols aside and can we put Jesus above and beyond everything else? Paul says in Romans 1 and 24, he says, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to the impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. He says, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Huh. They served the creature rather than the creator. They served the creature rather than the creator. I say that because when I look into our world, I see the body of Christ oftentimes serving the creature rather than the creator. And Peter, he, I'm sorry, Stephen, he, he responds by declaring their fathers rejected Moses. Stephen responds by declaring their fathers rejected God. And the last point shows that uh, Stephen responds by declaring uh, they rejected Jesus. Uh, look at what it says and picking up in verse 44. Look at what it says. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness. Just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob but it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. If you're following along, I want you to highlight in verse 52, uh, where it says, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Uh, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. Now, here we see that uh, Stephen, he, he begins to tie this all together now. Um, and again, he's still speaking to the council. Uh, he speaks to Israel's history of creating a dwelling place for God. But in verse 48, he states that God does not dwell in houses made by hand. <laughs> uh, and, and before he begins to start quoting the prophet in, in verse 49, he says that heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. So again, you know, we see that this, this is consistent theme that, that uh, Stephen continues to give evidence that God has never been confined to a building, that God has never been confined to a temple. And, and so what we find is Stephen, he confronts idolatry. He confronts their idolatry. And this is one of the things I think that really makes them upset. This is really uh, one of the things that, 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 that really gets underneath their skin because, again, they had given, we're talking about uh, a context where uh, the Jews had gave so much reverence to the temple. This is the place where, you know, God is met. Um, and, you know, and, and the funny thing about it is, and I think we've taken some of that context even today, where oftentimes we we look at church as this is the place where I meet God, when when actually He is absent from the rest of our lives. <laughs> like like and, and here's the thing that Stephen, I mean this this is this is this is really good because Stephen is challenging and he's confronting this whole idea that I don't just meet God at a building that that God lives in me and He resides in me. Oh, he can't be absent in other areas of my life. I can't just mute. Because what happens when I don't go to church for two weeks? <laughs> where, where is 
God. I like uh, if, if he's just in the building and, you know, we don't go to church for two or three weeks like that. So we just miss God for <laughs> the last three weeks. And oftentimes, you know, uh, the, you know, sad thing that uh, if, if that's the context uh, that we understand or perceive God, uh, uh, many people find themselves again with Jesus being absent in their lives uh, <laughs> until they make it back to church. Uh, and, you know, and it's funny that in the minds and lives of some today, God might as well only live at the church, <laughs> you know, and, and, and again, that, that's a sad thing, but we have to really begin to confront the idolatry in it um, when we just look at the building as the place where we meet God rather than looking at the building, <laughs> the building of where God lives. This, this is the building that I think we need to be a little bit more concerned about, um, where God resides and does my life reflect that uh, we find that Stephen he confronted their resistance to the Holy Spirit he, you know he, he he speaks to that he, he, he tells them like man you like like you guys always resist the Holy Spirit Paul he talks about that when he says quench not the spirit uh, and, and Stephen his main point was unmistakable because he tells them as your fathers did so do you and so now he's connecting the, uh, the father's sins to the son's like, man, you don't, you're not off the hook. And this is one of the same things that we could even say about ourselves. As we read this scripture, this, I mean, this passage, certainly it was uh, for an original audience, but we are the audience today and we're, we're not off the hook because in many ways as the fathers did, so do we, it's just in a different context. And so here's, again, we have this opportunity, um, to lay our lives down so God can bring correction to our lives. But verse 51, Stephen's like, man, you stiff-necked people. <laughs> and, 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 and I just pray, God, don't allow me to be a stiff-necked person. Because, I mean, if truth comes my way, God, I want to be able to recognize it. Help me to recognize truth. I might be challenging some things that I believe for many, many years. But God, if truth comes and I'm in error, allow me not to be stiff-necked. And this one of these people, truth stared them right in the face. They were stiff-necked people. And, 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 and Stephen, he points out, he's like, man, you're no different than your fathers. Your fathers are stiff-necked. You're stiff-necked. You guys always resist the spirit. What does my life look like when the spirit takes control? And again, it requires the laying down of my life. And, 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 and here's the thing. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, it's good to be confronted. It's, it's good to be confronted, um, you know, uh, and, and to be challenged. And, there, there, you know, there's a bit of a difference between confrontation and conviction. I mean, that's why I tell people, I mean, I, I embrace conviction because that means that the spirit is in me that, that's working. But being confronted means that somebody else actually has to point out <laughs> what I should already be convicted of. <laughs> and, and, and so I would rather be convicted than to be confronted. Um, but, but if I am confronted, then I, at that point in time, it's like, man, I, I should be ready to lay down my life. Um, and I, and I remember, uh, my, my being confronted by my sister some, some, some time ago when we were really little, um, I, I remember I'm four years old. I used to sit on the stoop and I used to sit on the stoop and as grownups would walk by, I would just be like, um, can I have some money? <laughs> I really remember that. I'm living on 19th and Chambers, and people used to walk down that block, and I, the corner store, I live right next door to the corner store. All I knew is like, man, I could take that money, and I could go buy me two packs of Nihilators and <laughs> a charm sucker. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's all I remember. And so people would get, my mother never knew, uh, uh, you know, what I was doing, but that's what I was doing. And, uh, and so one day my sister, um, I think she might have been about nine years old at the time. She said, where do you get this money from? And I'm like, um, I found it outside. And at that time, I didn't realize I was lying. I just felt like I was protecting myself. Um, when I found out that lying actually existed <laughs> at four years old, my sister, she took my money and she's like, this is my money because I lost a quarter when I was outside. <laughs> and at that moment, I realized like she confronted my lying, but as she was confronting my lying, I realized that, man, she's a liar. <laughs> she didn't lose that money. Like somebody gave me that money. But the whole point of the matter is, is like, again, I would rather to be convicted than to be confronted. 
And and so you know here it is that Stephen he he's he's now confronting uh, you know you guys you murdered the prophets like what prophets have you not killed? And not only did you kill the prophets, you killed Jesus. So so you rejected everything that God has sent. That, that that was meant to, to deliver you. You have a history of this. And and, and he confronted their failure of keeping uh, the law. The very person that they said that they honored, the very person that they, they worshiped the teachings of Moses. He's like, man, you, 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 don't, you don't even keep his word. They prided themselves in, the, in their obedience to the law, yet they rejected the word that, that spoke of Jesus. The very word that spoke of Jesus. And when Jesus came, you know, they rejected the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And this is something that <laughs> the word came into the world to save the world. And it's, 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 it's really interesting that he came to his own people and was rejected by his own people. The very one that they... <laughs> had read on the very one that they have was waiting on and all of those things. But I mean, nothing could be greater than the sacrifice that, that, that he would make that Jesus would be willing to lay his life down. He says, you don't take my life. He's like, I lay it down. Um, and I lay it down for the sins of the world, for he laid it down for my sins, for your sins. Like he laid it down for those that are even rejecting him today. His life is laid down. Salvation is still made to them. Um, and he, he laid it down for those who can't seem to get themselves right. He laid it down for those who feel shameful of their situations, those who feel like they're not worthy. God, he laid his life down for you. He laid his life down for you to have salvation. He laid his life down for you to flourish in the life that he designed for you to live. It's the price that he paid. All he asked, man, in order for us to operate and to walk, in that newness of life is to be willing to lay down the old life and to raise up new. My challenge to you is that this week, this week, this week, this week, this week, that I allow my life to reflect that God is Lord in my life, that my life will reflect and not reject Christ as Lord of my life. Let us pray. God, you're good. We love you. We thank you right now for your mercy, for your grace, your love, and your kindness. God.